Heavenly Father, we thank you for our Bible study tonight. We bless your name for the love and the interest and the passion and the zeal you've given us to come every Monday like this and study the Word together. Thank you for our brothers and sisters in various locations all over this city and all over this state and all over this country, Nigeria, and outside Nigeria, that we're having the fellowship together and are studying your Word together. We are praying, O oh Lord, as we are blessing your people here, you bless all those who are listening also at this time in Jesus' name. We are praying, O oh Lord, that your word will enrich our hearts. We will be doers of the word, and you help us to have remembrance of what we will read and study in Jesus' name. We are praying, O oh Lord, that the grace to be obedient to your word you grant to every one of us. That leaders and workers and members and invitees will be blessed in your presence in Jesus' name. Thank you, Lord, because we know you have answered. In Jesus' name we pray. We thank God for the progress we are making in the study of the word of God. We'll be studying from the book of Revelation. And we started chapter 14 just about two or three weeks ago. This will be the third study in this chapter 14. And in this chapter 14, we're not looking at it from verse 14 through to verse 20. Please open your Bible as we read together and read along with me. In Revelation chapter 14, reading from verse 14, And I looked, and behold, a white cloud. And upon the cloud one sat like the, unto the Son of Man, having on his head a golden crown, and in his hand a sharp sickle. And another angel came out of the temple, crying unto, crying with a loud voice to him that sat on the cloud, thrust in thy sickle, and reap. For the time is come for, for thee to reap, for the harvest of the earth is ripe. And, is, and he that sat on the throne, thrust in his sickle on the earth, and the earth was reaped. And another angel came out of the temple, which is in heaven. He also having a sharp sickle. And another angel came out from the altar, at which had the power over fire, and cried with a loud cry to him that had the sharp sickle, saying, Thrust in thy sharp sickle, and gather the clusters of the vine of the earth, and for the graves are fully ripe. And the angel thrust in a sickle into the earth, and gathered the vine of the earth, and cast it into the great winepress of the wrath of God. And the winepress was trodden without the city, outside the city. And blood came out of the winepress, even unto the horse bridles, by the space of a thousand and six hundred furlongs. That's what we're looking at today. <coughs> And as we study this word of God today, you will see the title here. It's titled, The Final Harvest of the Judgment of the World. Earlier in this chapter, the angel who preached the everlasting gospel had also announced that the hour of judgment is come. If you look at verses 6 and 7, just to refresh your memory, it says, And I saw another angel fly in the midst of heaven, that is, in the heavenly and the skies, having the everlasting gospel to preach unto them that dwell on the earth, and to every nation and kindred and tongue and people, saying with a loud voice, Fear God, and give glory to him, for the hour of his judgment is come. The hour of his judgment is come. And worship him that made heaven and earth and the sea and the fountains of waters. That's what the angel was studying about last week. That's what he proclaimed in that revelation. Now that proclamation was followed by another announcement that the great city of Babylon is falling. And the passage before us today reveals actually two visions. Visions of a great harvest. There are two kinds of harvest to see here. Because first of all, you see the Son of Man sitting on the cloud, having a sharp sickle in his hand. And an angel came from the presence of God, coming out of the temple. And he said, thrust in thy sickle and reap, because the harvest of the earth is now ready for you to reap. After that had been done, another angel coming from the temple spoke to the other one, this one at the altar, speaking to him, saying, you also, you will thrust in your sickle and reap. Which is still talking about harvest. And in those two visions, actually, there are similarities among them. And there are also differences between the two of them. For example, the first one talks about the grain harvest. What we call grain, the wheat, the wheat harvest. 
that is when you harvest the uh, wheat you remove the wheat from the chaff and you separate them you throw away the chaff and then you keep the real thing which is the meal and then the grape harvest and this grape harvest will be thrown into the wine press and trodden under so that the Jews inside will come out but all these things are, sy are symbols and they are just illustrations of the people that will be judged by the hand of the Lord on the final day there's a sharp sickle in, in each of these uh, visions and there's a reaping in each of them but the two visions uh, the differences are actually many details the grain harvest is the false vision that is reaped by the son of man who is to separate the chaff from the wheat the grape harvest which is the second one is gathered by an angel and it is the harvest of the graves the wicked on the earth in their multitudes they are thrown into the wine press of unmitigated unadulterated rods and fury of the almighty god as we talk about judgment the final harvest of the judgment of the world and there are people that may begin to think will there really be a judgment yes there's going to be a judgment and as you think about it you'll see all over the bible the bible tells us there is judgment even here on earth now and it's going to be that final judgment and there are things that actually make us to know that judgment is demanded number one the prophecies of the lord as we look at the prophecies, whether it's in Isaiah or Jeremiah or Ezekiel or in the minor prophets, or you go back to the Psalms, anywhere you go in the Bible, there are prophecies up from the Lord telling us there will be judgment, a final judgment. Number two, the parables of the Lord. Read all the parables of the Lord Jesus Christ once again. And you are going to find that those parables tell us that there is going to be judgment, a final judgment that is coming. Number three, the punishments from the Lord punishments in the plural that is to go back to history and you look at Sodom and Gomorrah punishment came you look at the Canaanites punishment came you look at old Babylon the Chaldeans punishment came and you look at the Roman government or you look at the Grecian government or the Middle Persian government punishment eventually came and from all that we have read of the Lord punishments from the Lord in the past that convinces us this God has not changed there will still be punishment number four the principle of life as we look at life, there's a principle that the Lord has laid down. And that is the law or the principle of sowing and reaping. If you sow the wind, you are going to reap one wind. If you sow iniquity, you are going to reap the punishment and the suffering and the judgment of God. Because of the principle of life, we know that the time is coming when the judgment will be, number five, the purpose of the law. Why will the Lord give the law if there was no reason to it? If he wasn't going to punish the people that break the law, why will he give the law? Because of the purpose of the law. That's why we know that there's going to be judgment eventually. Number six, probation in life. You see, as we're here in the, in the world, it's a time of probation. It's a time of trial. The Lord is leaving us here and is saying, this is your chance to make your choice. And this period of probation in life tells us the probation will not continue forever. And therefore, when that time comes to an end, there is going to be judgment. Number seven, the preeminence of the Lord. If the devil could do whatever he would do and there will be no judgment, if the fallen angels would do whatever they would do and there will be no judgment, if wicked men, sinful men will do whatever they would want to do and there will be no judgment then God is not preeminent God is not the highest God is not the almighty but because he is preeminent and because he is high above all the preeminence of the Lord demands that there will be a final judgment upon this world number one the prophecies from the Lord number two the parables of the Lord number three the punishments of the past from the Lord and then number four the principle of life number five the purpose of the law number six the probation in life number seven the preeminence of the Lord all these seven things demand that there will be judgment eventually and that's why it says that uh, the harvest of the judgment of the world now I need to explain this word the harvest to you come back to Revelation chapter 14 verse 15 in Revelation chapter 14 verse 15 it says and another angel came out of the temple crying with a loud voice to him that sat on the cloud thrust in thy sickle and read for the time is come for thee to reap for the harvest of the earth is ripe the harvest of the earth is ripe as you check up in your Bible you are going to find that there are different ways that word harvest is used and two principal ways the word harvest is used number one is used in the sense of evangelism 
It's used in the sense of soul winning. It's used in the sense of preaching to other people. And that is referred to as harvest. If you look at your Bible in Matthew chapter 9, Matthew chapter 9, we're reading the last two verses there, you'll see the way the Lord Jesus Christ used the word harvest. And you will see that it relates with evangelism, soul winning, preaching to people, bringing them out of the world out of sin, and bringing them to the Lord. In Matthew chapter 9, verses 37 and 38, Then saith he to his disciples, The harvest truly is plenteous, but the laborers are few. Pray ye therefore, the Lord of the harvest, that he will send forth laborers into his harvest. You see harvest in verse 37, harvest in verse 38, that harvest is referring to soul winning. Pray that there will be preachers. Pray that there will be evangelists. Pray that there will be those who have the knowledge and the experience and they will cause sinners to repentance. That is harvest in the sense of evangelism and soul winning. In John chapter 4, John chapter 4, reading from verse 35, see the way the word harvest is used here. Say ye not, say not ye. There are yet four months, and then cometh the harvest. That's the word again. Behold, I say unto you, lift up your eyes and look on the fields, for they are white already to harvest. That's the word again. He that reapeth receiveth wages and gathereth fruit unto life eternal. That's evangelism. You go out and you're preaching the gospel, and the people are responding, and they're coming to know the Lord as their personal Savior, and you're gathering the fruit unto life eternal, that both he that soweth and he that reapeth may rejoice together. That tells you then the word harvest is used, number one, in the sense of evangelism preaching the gospel, telling others of the Lord, bringing them to the Savior. But there's another way the word harvest is used. It's used in the sense of judgment coming upon people. And that is the sense in which we're looking at each in this uh, Revelation chapter 14, in Jeremiah chapter 51. Jeremiah chapter 51, I'm reading from verse 33. In Jeremiah 51 verse 33, For thus says the Lord of hosts, the God of Israel, the daughter of Babylon is like a threshing floor. It is time to thresh her for a little, yet a little while, and the time of her harvest shall come. Here is another way the word harvest is used. And as you look at this same chapter, look at verse 44, for example. It says, And I will punish Baal in Babylon, and I will bring forth out of his mouth that which he has swallowed up, and the nation shall not flow together any more unto him. Yea, the wall of Babylon shall fall. Look at verse 47. Therefore, Behold, the day is come that I will, ju I will do judgment upon the graven images of Babylon, and her whole land shall be confounded, and all her slain shall fall in the midst of her. You will see then in that passage that the word uh, harvest is used in connection with judgment. Uh, please turn your Bible to Matthew chapter 13. Matthew chapter 13. And see the way, another way that Jesus Christ used the word uh, harvest. In Matthew chapter 13, I'm reading to you from verse 13. Matthew chapter 13, reading from verse 13. Let both grow together unto the harvest. In the time of harvest, I will say to the reapers, gather ye together first the tares, and bind them in bundles upon them, but gather the wheat into my barn. He explains uh, what actually was, he says there. As you look at verse 36, then Jesus sent the multitude away and when he went into the house and his disciples came unto him saying declare unto us the parable of the tares of the field and he answered and said unto them he that sows the good seed is the son of man the field is the world the good seed are the children of the kingdom but the tares are the children of the wicked one the enemy that sowed them is the devil the harvest is the end of the world the harvest this is not evangelism anymore now in the original uh, case when jesus used the word harvest he used it in the sense of evangelism the laborers are few. The harvest is plenteous. You go out and harvest and bring souls into life eternal. But in this case now, it's telling us that there's another use of the word harvest. And it tells us that the harvest 
is the end of the world. Then he tells us in verse, uh, in verse 14, As therefore the tares are gathered and burnt in the fire, so shall it be in the end of this world. The Son of Man shall send forth his angels and shall gather out of, of his kingdom all things that offend and them that do iniquity and shall cast them into the furnace of fire. There shall be wailing and gnashing of teeth. Do you understand then, as we look at the passage today, and we're looking at the harvest of the world, it's not evangelism now, because you understand that in, in Revelation chapter 14, you're already in the great tribulation period. And in that great tribulation period, as it comes to almost its finality, and at the close of the great tribulation, there's going to be terrible, terrible judgment, punishment, wrath, fury upon the people of the world at this time. Before I move on, let me just tell you this. Those who miss... The harvest of evangelism and salvation will take part in the harvest of judgment and eternal punishment. Two kinds of harvest. Harvest in the sense of evangelism, in the sense of soul winning, in the sense of salvation, in the sense of being born again, in the sense of responding to the call of Jesus and coming into the kingdom. When you respond to the first harvest and you are harvested into the kingdom of God, if you remain in that kingdom of God, you miss the other harvest that is yet to come, the harvest of judgment. But when you refuse the first harvest, I will say, no, I don't want to be evangelized. I don't want to be born again. I don't want to come into the kingdom of God. I refuse that first interpretation of the harvest. Then you are waiting for the other harvest, which is the harvest of the judgment of God. That's why Jeremiah says in Jeremiah chapter 8, Jeremiah chapter 8, reading there in verse 20. In Jeremiah chapter 8, verse 20. Here we find some people lamenting, and what is uh, their lamentation about? It says uh, very clearly here, the harvest is past, and the summer is ended, and we are not saved. We've lost our chance. We missed our way. The harvest is gone. The harvest of evangelism. Uh, the preaching is not going to be forever. The Bible study is not going to be forever. When Jesus comes, the people of God who have responded to the harvest of evangelism and soul winning, they go with the Lord. And then the rest of the people, they are waiting behind and are saying, what am I going to do? The harvest has ended. The harvest has passed. The summer is ended and we are not saved. That's why we're praying that all our friends, all our neighbors, all the people we'll be speaking to and endeavoring to invest them into the kingdom of God, they will respond positively at this time in Jesus' name. And then when this harvest we're reading about in the book of Revelation will be taking place, they will not suffer with the people of the world at that time in Jesus' name. In Revelation chapter 14, we're starting today from verse 14 to verse 20. And I divide the message to three parts. Number one, the exalted judge of the earth. The exalted judge of the earth. Number two, the end time judgment of the earth. The end time judgment of the earth. Number three, the execution of judgment of the judgment of the earth. I come to point number one, the exalted judge of the earth. Please come back to Revelation chapter 14 verse 14. Revelation chapter 14 verse 14. And I look, and behold the white cloud and upon the cloud one that sat, one sat like unto the Son of Man, having on his head a golden crown, and in his hand a sharp sickle. Already this is very, very simple. If you remember, if you recollect the words of Jesus Christ when he was still here on earth, and he spoke very plainly and very clearly to the people, you will not have any difficulty interpreting what we have read just now. And I, and I looked, and behold, a white cloud. That's what John saw. And then he said, and then he saw somebody sitting upon that cloud, and he saw unto, unto, like unto the Son of Man. And you recognize who that is? Who is the Son of Man? Jesus Christ. And then he said, having on his head a golden crown. That means he's a king. That means he's Lord. That means he's master. That means he has all authority on earth and in heaven. And then it says in his hand, a sharp sickle. 
Here John's attention was drawn and arrested to a new vision. And he sees our Lord Jesus Christ, the Son of God, the Son of Man, himself coming forth. And he comes on a bright, splendid, dazzling cloud appropriate to, to be the seed of the crowned king, the Son of God, the Son of Man. He appears in the vision in his human form, whom John at once recognized as the Son of Man, the peculiar title that Jesus used when he was here on earth. That was the favorite term that the Savior, the Lord Jesus Christ himself, chose to speak of himself during the period of his earthly ministry, Christ the Lord, the Son of Man, the Son of God, the Lamb of God. He referred to himself many times as the Son of Man. Only that in this vision, in this revelation now being revealed to John, he saw him having on his head a golden crown. He is crowned as king and is revealed in his kingly royal office and power for the work he's about to accomplish. And then we're told, looking at his hand, there was something in his hand that he is a sharp sickle. A, a sickle is a special kind of knife that is used in gathering the harvest, used for cutting off the clusters of graves. As we look at the Lord Jesus Christ here, we see him as a judge. Let, let, let's allow scripture to interpret scripture for us. As we look at him, uh, we, we notice some things is on a bright cloud. And then he has a crown on his head. And he has a sickle in his hand. And he is to judge the earth. He is to cut down the graves. He is to cut down the graves. He is to bring the judgment of God upon the people that will be living on earth in the time of the great tribulation. In Revelation chapter 1 verse 7. Revelation chapter 1 verse 7. Behold, he cometh with clouds. You see that if you compare scripture with scripture. In chapter 14 verse 14, I saw a bright cloud. And one that sat on that cloud like unto the Son of Man. Here it tells us, Behold, he cometh with clouds, and every eye shall see him, and they also which pierced him, and all the kindreds of the earth shall wail because of him, even so Amen. In Daniel chapter 7, Daniel chapter 7, we're looking at uh, this uh, one that is on the bright cloud. If you have studied the Old Testament and the New Testament, as you come to the book of Revelation, you will not have difficulty at all recognizing the personalities that are revealed there. In Daniel chapter 7, verses 13 and 14, Daniel 7, Verse 13 and 14, looking at the identity of the one that is sitting on that cloud that we've just read about now in the book of Revelation. Daniel chapter 7, reading from verse 13. And I saw in the night visions, and behold, one, like, on, like the Son of Man, came with the clouds of heaven. You see that? One, like unto the Son of Man, he came with the clouds of heaven and came to the ancient of days that the Almighty God, the great I am that I am, the eternal one, he came to the, uh, to the ancient of days and they brought him near unto him. And there was given him dominion and glory and a kingdom that all people and nations and languages shall serve him. His dominion is an everlasting dominion which shall not pass away and his kingdom that which shall not be destroyed. It's talking about the Lord Jesus Christ and he's saying that he will judge this world. We've seen him on the cloud. We also will see his majesty. We'll see his glory. We'll see his splendor. And we'll see his authority. We'll see his might. In Revelation chapter 1 verse 13. Revelation chapter 1 verse 13. And in the midst of the seven candlesticks, one like unto the Son of Man. Here he comes again. The Son of Man. In Daniel we read about him. The Son of Man coming with the clouds. In Revelation chapter 14 we've seen him, the Son of Man, sitting on the cloud. And here in Revelation chapter 1, is still the same personality, the Son of Man, clothed with a garment down to the foot, and girt about the paths with a golden girdle. His head and his ears were white like wool, as white as snow, and his eyes were as a flame of fire, and his feet like unto fine brass, as if they were born in a furnace, and his voice was the sound of many waters. And he that arch and 
and he had in his right hand the seven stars. Out of his mouth went a sharp two-edged sword, and his countenance was as the sun shineth in his strength. And when I saw him, I fell at his feet as dead, and he laid his hand on me, and saying unto me, Fear not, I am the first and the last. Again, you see the Lord here revealing himself. He said, I am he that liveth and was dead, and behold, I am alive forevermore. Amen. And have the keys of hell and of death. All we're saying is that the one that sat on the, on the cloud that we have read about in Revelation chapter 14 is none other than our Lord Jesus Christ, than the Son of Man, the Son of God, the judge of the whole earth. In uh, Matthew chapter 24, Jesus Christ himself has spoken about this, that a time will come when the Son of Man will arrive and it will come in the clouds of heaven. In, in Matthew chapter 24, reading from verse 30 and verse 30, one, then shall appear the sign of the Son of Man in heaven, and then shall all the tribes of the earth mourn, and they shall see the Son of Man coming in the clouds of heaven with power and great glory. Jesus said so, that he will come. And at the time of his second coming, he will come with power and great glory, but he will be coming in the clouds. In verse 31, and he shall send his angels with a great sound of a trumpet, and they shall gather together the select from the four winds and from the one end of heaven unto the other. In um, Matthew chapter 26, Matthew chapter 26, reading from verse 63, 26, verse 63. But Jesus held his peace. This was at the time of his trial. As he held his peace, then the high priest answered and said unto him, I adjure thee by the living God, that thou tell us whether thou be the, the Christ, the Son of God. And Jesus said unto him, Thou hast said, Nevertheless, I say unto you, hereafter, Shall ye see the Son of Man sitting on the right hand of power, coming in the clouds of heaven? It's very clear then that we're reading about the Lord Jesus Christ, but when he comes at that time, he'll be coming to judge in Luke chapter 21. Luke chapter 21, reading from verse 25. Luke 21, reading from verse 25. And there shall be signs in the sun, and in the moon, and in the stars, and upon the earth, distress of nations with perplexity and uh, the sea and the waves roaring, men's hearts failing them for fear and for looking after those things which are coming on the earth, for the powers of heaven shall be shaken. And then shall they see the Son of Man coming in a cloud with power and great glory. Very clearly then the Lord Jesus Christ will come. And when he comes, he will judge this world. You know that Jesus Christ has been referred to as the Lamb of God that takes away the sin of the world. But that's just his ministry now. That's why his blood is cleansing us. That's why he's saving us. That's why he's sanctifying us. Jesus also that he might sanctify the people suffered without the gate. It is at this time we can get saved and we can get sanctified by the washing and the cleansing and the purifying agency of the blood of the Lamb. But if we reject the Lamb, we're waiting for the Lion of the tribe of Judah. Today, he is the Lamb of God. Tomorrow, he'll be the Lion. Today, he is Savior. Tomorrow, he'll be Judge. If you refuse him as Savior today, you'll meet him tomorrow as Judge. Today, he is the Advocate. He's the one that is pleading for us. If you refuse him as the Advocate today, he's going to become your Judge on the final day. He's a Deliverer today, delivering us from sin, delivering us from all the consequences of sin, and delivering us and taking us out out of darkness into his marvelous light. But if you reject him as a deliverer today, tomorrow you are waiting for him as a judge. Today he is a mediator. And as the mediator, he is the one pleading for us. He is the one that is pleading with the Father. I died for him. I died for her. Forgive her. Cleanse her. Change her life. Make her a new creature. Bring her into your kingdom. But the Almighty God is saying, yes, I want to do that because of you. But he's not repenting. He's not believing on you. And because he does not believe, how can I save him without believing? He is your mediator today. But if you reject him as mediator tomorrow, he'll be your judge. Today is your intercessor. 
He's the one that is pleading at the right hand of the Father. And he's saying, he died for you. And he wants to supply all your needs. Give your life to the Lord Jesus Christ and be born again. Come out of the world and come out of all your sins. Because the Lord Jesus Christ is praying and interceding for you. But if you refuse him today as the intercessor, then he'll become your judge on the final day. Today is a peacemaker. He's making peace between God and man. Is the prince of peace. Holding the hand of God because he's the son of God. Holding the hand of men because he's the son of man. And reconciling us unto his father, his heavenly father. But if you reject him today as the peacemaker, then you are waiting for the time when he will not be the peacemaker anymore, when he will be the judge. And when he comes to judge, what kind of judge is he? Number one, is the foreordained judge. The foreordained judge. What that means is that it had been foreordained. It had been predicted. It, he had been appointed as the judge. The judge that will come. The judge that will judge the whole earth. The father has placed all authority in his hand and is the one to judge. The foreordained judge. Number two is the faithful judge. He will never miss anyone. He will never mistake the record of anyone to an, for another person. You know, in the courts of this world, there are times when files are misplaced. Or files are interchanged. And they are putting the judgment of another person on somebody who is maybe very innocent. But he is a faithful judge. is going to judge righteously. is going to judge according to the truth. is going to judge according to everything that you have done. Because all the facts are open before him. Is a foreordained judge. Number one is a faithful judge. Number two, number three is a faultless judge. There is no way you can fault his judgment. Because he's going to judge to the very motive, to the very attitude, to the very disposition, to the very action, and everything you have done. And he never forgets anything. He remembers everything. He's a silent listener to every conversation you have, and he's a silent observer to every action of your hand, and everywhere you go, everything you do in secret or in, or in, the, or in darkness, there is no darkness before him. Darkness is light before him. He is a faultless judge. Number four is a firm and fearless judge. The firm and the fearless judge. He fears no one. And because he fears no one, he judges according to truth. He judges according to righteousness. And when you stand on the final day, he knows all the opportunities you have got to get saved. He knows all the privileges you have got to read the Bible. He knows the church you have been attending. He knows the word that has been sent to you. He knows everyone that has warned you. Everyone that has corrected you. Everyone that has said you can pray. Everyone that is saying I'm praying for you. Every help you have received to get you saved and to get you restored and to get you sanctified. He knows everything. And then when you eventually come, if you refuse that salvation and refuse sanctification, he'll be the firm and the fearless judge. Number five, it will be the very furious judge. Because now it's not like the meek, lowly lamb of God, gentle and humble. It's not the lion of the tribe of Judah. And in the passages we have read, it says his voice is like thunder. His voice is like many waters, like many oceans. And he roars and he terrifies the people that come to that judgment because they have refused the day of mercy and they have refused the grace of God. Is a fairy and a furious judge. Number six is a forced the last and only judge. The first, the last, and the only judge. When he speaks, there's no other utterance. There's no other thing that anybody can say. The first and the last. The preeminent one. The omnipotent one. And the one that has all authority on earth and in heaven. And when Jesus stands up to judge, that is final. Because of the first and the last and the only judge. There are many people today that are jesting and joking with their salvation. They say, well, I'm not in the Christian religion. I have my own religion. Wait a minute. The Lord Jesus Christ, when he becomes the judge, is going to judge every tribe and every people and every nation and every continent and everybody. He's going to judge the illiterate and the illiterate. He's going to judge the men and the women. He's going to judge the young and the old. He's going to judge the bound and the free. There is no other judge anywhere. There is no founder of any religion that is going to judge their people in their religion. Jesus Christ is this first, last, only judge, and you are at his mercy. Number seven is the future and the final judge. The future and the final judge. The end of this world is in the hand of the Lord Jesus Christ. And the end and the destiny of anyone is in the hand of the Lord Jesus Christ, the future and the final judge. 
has prophesied and predicted Christ will appear at the end of the world, at the time of the consummation of all things, and the great harvest of the world will be reaped. When the grain harvest of the harvest field, when they are gathered, the wheat is separated from the chaff, and the chaff will be burnt, while the wheat will be gathered into the garner. At the end of time, the unrepentant sinners will then be cast into the lake of fire, into the furnace of fire, while the righteous shall shine forth as the sun in the, in the kingdom of their father. I pray that you will escape this judgment. You give your life to the Lord Jesus Christ, merciful Jesus, loving Jesus, compassionate Jesus, forgiving Jesus, who is a God that can pardon like this, a pardoning God like this, that is inviting you. Don't wait too late. Come to the Lord and be born again. Give your life to the Lord Jesus Christ. Then mercy will be given unto you. And then this day of judgment, you'll just be looking at the people that are being judged, but you'll be free forever in Jesus' name. I come to point number two, the end time judgment judgment of the earth the end time judgment of the earth we're looking at uh, revelation chapter 14 verses 15 and 16 revelation chapter 14 verses 15 and 16 it tells us and another angel came out of the temple crying with a loud voice to him that sat on the on on the cloud thrust in thy sickle and reap for the time is come for thee to reap for the harvest of the earth is ripe and he, he that sat on the cloud thrust in his sickle on the earth and the earth was reaped and the earth was reaped here we find uh, the lord jesus christ an angel came from the uh, from the temple if you look at verse 15 another another angel came out of the temple that angel that came out of the temple came from the immediate presence of god for the temple is regarded as the peculiar dwelling place of the almighty god and then he cried with a loud voice to him that sat on the cloud this command that he gave the Lord Jesus Christ is not the command of the angel, by the way. He was coming from the presence of God. Almighty God had given him the word to go and tell his only beloved son, his only begotten son. And it was the word of the Father. It was the word of God. It was the commandment of God that the angel carried to Jesus Christ, the judge, to go forth and reap the great harvest of the world. This not a, an angel cannot command Jesus Christ. He is their king. He is their Lord. Because when he brought his first begotten into the world, he commanded all the angels to worship him. And since they are worshiping him, how can the worshippers then, how can they uh, command the Lord Jesus Christ? No, it was a commandment from the Father himself to the Son. Thrust in thy sickle, reap. For the time is come for thee to reap. This is the grain harvest that the Lord Jesus Christ himself has spoken about in one of his parables. He spoke of the reaping of the wheat into the Ghana and the gathering of the tears to be burnt with unquenchable fire. And then let's look at uh, this. As you think about uh, this, uh, throwing in the sickle and reaping has been predicted and prophesied in the Old Testament. And then Jesus Christ came to shed light on the whole thing when he was teaching in his earthly ministry. In Joel chapter 3, I'm reading from verse 12. Joel chapter 3. Let's read from verse 12. And you will see that this uh, judgment that the uh, father is now commanding the son through this angel to uh, thrust in the sickle and reap. It has been prophesied in the Old Testament in Joel chapter 3 verse 12. Let the heathen be wicked and come up unto the come up to the valley of Jehoshaphat. For there will I see to judge all the heathen round about. Put ye in the sickle, for the harvest is ripe. Come, get you down, for the press is full, and the fats overflow, for their wickedness is great. You will see then as uh, the Lord Jesus was being told to thrust in the sickle, it was a sickle of cutting down the sinners, cutting down the unbelievers, cutting down the unrepentant, impenitent ones, and cutting them down so that they can be thrown into the wine press of the judgment of the Lord. It says, multitudes, multitudes, in the valley of decision. For the day of the Lord is near in the valley of decision. The decision here is that, you know, there, there are people that they have lost their chance. The day of grace has gone for them, and they're still fighting against the Lord. It says in verse 15, the sun and the moon shall be darkened, and the stars 
Asha will draw their shining. The Lord also shall roar out of Zion and utter his voice from Jerusalem, and the heavens and the earth shall shake. But the Lord will be the hope of his people and the strength of the children of Israel. And you'll see it saying that at this time, that's the time of the great tribulation, when the sun and the moon shall be darkened, and the stars shall withdraw their shining. That's the time of the great tribulation. It's at that time that the Jewish people, the, Isra the Israelites, will be calling upon the Lord because they would have realized they have pushed away their salvation, their redemption, their Savior, their Messiah. They have pushed him away too long. And now they'll be crying unto the Lord. And that's what he's telling us here about uh, the time of the harvest and the judgment that will be coming upon them. In Matthew chapter 16. Matthew chapter 16, we're reading from verse 27. Here the Lord Jesus Christ himself speaking to his own disciples, assuring them of things that are yet to come and telling them that uh, the world will not just go on like this, rejecting salvation, rejecting the mercy of God, rejecting the righteousness of God and just be doing whatever they want. There's going to be a time of accounting, a time of, uh, of, uh, a time of uh, responding, a time when they would know that what they have done is not the right sin. In Matthew chapter 16 verse 27 it says for the son of man shall come in the glory of his father with his angels and then shall he reward every man according to his works he is the one to do it the judgment end time judgment of the earth it will come eventually it becomes very clear as we look at Matthew chapter 13 in Matthew chapter 13, and let's go back to that parable of the Lord Jesus Christ. And let's see how he himself interpreted the parable also. I'm starting from verse 24. Another parable put he forth unto them, saying, the, the kingdom of heaven is likened unto a man which sowed good seed in his field. But while men slept, his enemy came and sowed tares among the wheat and went his way. But when the blade was sprung up, and brought forth fruit. Then appeared the tears also. So the servants of the household came and said unto him, Sir, didst not thou sow good seed in thy field? From whence then as he tears? And he said unto them, An enemy has done this. The servant said unto him, Wilt thou then that we go and gather them up? But he said, Nay, lest while ye gather up the tears, ye root up also the wheat of them. Let both grow together until the harvest. And in the time of the harvest, I will say to the reapers, I, Jesus Christ, will say to the reapers, Gather ye together first the tears, bind them in bundles to bond them, but gather the wheat into my barn. Here the Lord Jesus Christ was uh, talking about the, the kingdom of God and the kingdom of heaven. Uh, right now, as you sometimes you wonder, as you come to the church, and you see there are people that are genuinely born again. They are serving the Lord. They love the Lord. They are obedient to the Lord. They are passionate for the Lord, and they want to do the will of God. Their will is totally surrendered to the will of God. And then you find in that same church, there are some people that are not sincere Christians. They have not given their lives to the Lord Jesus Christ. They may talk the talk and dress the dress and sing the singing and, and do everything like the people of God but they are, they are not for real they are counterfeits and uh, they are tires and then they you know they are growing up together and then we begin to see their character their behavior and we're saying this is not genuine this is not real this is not uh, this is not the real conversion that other people have experienced see this other brother this is genuine see that sister this is genuine this one is real but look at this one there's a lot of hypocrisy and covering up and then the servant said these ones that we know are fake they are counterfeit they are not for real shall we put pull them out, throw them out of the church, and the Lord Jesus said, no, don't do that, because you are not perfect in knowledge. There are some people that may look phony and fake to you, but they are real. There are some other people that are look real to you, you think they are genuine, but they are fake, they are counterfeit, leave them. They will keep on growing, let them keep on coming to the church, let them keep on worshipping and serving, don't know, throw out anybody, until the time of the harvest. Then at the time of the harvest, I will send my angels out. Those who will never make a mistake. And I will direct them. Because I'm the faithful judge. Because I'm the enlightened judge. Because I'm the judge that, that is faultless judge. I cannot make a mistake. I will direct my angels. And they will pick out those ones that are not for real. And when they are picked up, then they will be thrown into the furnace of fire. 
And that's why you'll find today in the church, uh, you are wondering sometimes, why didn't they send some of these people away? I mean, they just discipline these people, throw them away. Uh, because they, they're disturbing the lives of other people. And they're not for real. The Lord Jesus is telling us, pastors and leaders, uh, play it cool, be gentle about it. You don't throw everybody away. If you scatter everybody, you'll make a great mistake. There may be some babies there, some sincere people there, some real genuine believers there, but they have not grown to total maturity. And you may throw them away, leave them there. And in time of judgment, everything will be said to you. Look at what the Lord Jesus said as he gives us the interpretation from verse 36. Then Jesus said, Send the multitude away and went into the house. And his disciples came unto him saying declare unto us the parables of the tears of the field something you'll appreciate about the uh, about the disciples of jesus after they heard the word in the public they came to jesus christ again they said teach us more tell us more whatever we don't understand and uh, they were not they were not fed up with the teaching of the word of god they've heard it already but they wanted explanation enlightenment they wanted to go deeper in the understanding of the word of god tell us more about it and he said and he, and he answered and said unto them he that sows the good seed is the son of man the field is the world and the good seed are the children of the kingdom but the tares are the children of the wicked one they come to church they read the Bible, they come to Bible study, and they even mistakenly take the Lord's Supper with us. But they are the children of the wicked one. It tells us in verse 39, the enemy that sowed them is the devil. And the harvest is the end of the world. And the reapers are the angels. As therefore the tares are gathered and burnt in the fire, so shall it be in the end of this world. The Son of Man shall send forth his angels, and they shall gather out of his kingdom all things that offend. Those are the tares. The people that stay in the church, but they are offensive. Offensive to the new converts in the example in their lifestyle, and they make the newcomers to go astray. Instead of teaching them and leading them in the pattern of purity and righteousness, they make them to do things that are evil, things that are sinful. It says they are the people that offend. And then it says, and them which do iniquity. The people that just go full scale, and they do iniquity. They come to church, they do iniquity. They are reading the Bible, but all the same, they still do iniquity in their places of work and in their families. They do not have the evidence of genuine conversion. It says in verse 42, and shall cast them into a furnace of fire. There shall be weeping and gnashing of teeth. And that's the end time judgment of the earth. And that's what we're read about in Revelation chapter 14, verses 15 and 16. Actually, you, I told you before, but I'm going to read it to you now, that the Father has appointed Jesus Christ as foreordained that Jesus Christ will be the judge. In, in John chapter 5, from verse 22. John chapter 5, reading from verse 22. For the Father judges no man, but he has committed all judgment unto the Son. He has committed all judgment unto the Son, that all, all men should honor the Son, even as they honor the Father. And he that honoreth, he that honoreth not the Son, honoreth not the Father, which has sent him. Uh, you have come across some religious people, and they tell you, oh, they believe in God. And they believe in, the, in God Almighty. Only that they don't believe in Jesus Christ. Wait a minute. If you don't honor the Son, you are not honoring the Father. And the judgment of your life and the judgment of the, uh, your destiny is in the hand of the Lord Jesus Christ. In verse 24, Verily, verily, I say unto you, He that heareth my word and believeth on him that sent me has everlasting life and shall not come into condemnation, but is passed from death unto life. Verily, verily, I say unto you, the hour is coming and now is when the dead shall hear the voice of the son of God and they that hear shall live then he goes on in verse 26 for the father has life in himself so has he given to the son to have life in himself and has given him authority to execute judgment also he has given him authority to execute judgment also because he is a son of man marvel not at this for the hour is coming, and in the which all that are in the grave shall hear his voice, 
and he shall come forth. And they that have done good unto the resurrection of life, and they that have done evil unto the resurrection of damnation. Well, then we understand what the Lord is telling us. He's telling us that the time of judgment is coming. And at that time, there will be the reaping. And this uh, judgment is described in various ways. In fact, just speak the words of Jesus Christ alone. And as he describes the final judgment that will come upon the people of the world, number one, he describes it as eternal punishment. Eternal punishment. Number two, he describes it as suffering and torment. He's the one that told the story of that rich man that said, I am tormented in this plane. Many, many times, number three, Jesus spoke about this final judgment and he said there will be weeping and gnashing of teeth. The strongest men will cry. And the, hard, the, uh, the hardest hearts will break down because there will be weeping and gnashing of teeth. Number four, uh, Jesus spoke about it as eternal separation from God. Eternal separation from Christ. Eternal separation from the holy angels. Eternal separation from the righteous. You think about it, even in this life in which we live now, if you are totally separated from good people, kind people, loving people, nice people, how would you live your life? That if the Lord were just to punish you, with just to separate you from the people that are kind and loving and generous and compassionate, and he just kills you with the people that are evil, what a great punishment that is. And that's the punishment that people are going to have in all eternity. They'll be totally forever, eternally separated from God, separated from Christ, separated from the holy angels, separated from the righteous. Number five, Jesus Christ described the punishment that will come upon the lost, upon the sinners on the final day. He says it will be eternal association with Satan, eternal association with evil angels, eternal, eternal association with the wicked, because he said, he will say, depart from me, ye wicked, unto everlasting fire, prepared for the devil and his angels. If anybody has been mistakenly taken into the prison, he'll tell you the story. When he lock up some people in the custody, the criminals that are there, that are hiding criminals, and he's spending just one night or a few nights with them, those criminals, they torture them. Because, ah, you have just come. What brought you here? And they don't care whether you say in the name of Jesus, name of this or name of that. They torture people. And that is what is going to happen on the final day. When the sinners, the people that do iniquity, the people that are unrepentant, the people that do not give their lives to the Lord Jesus Christ, the people that say, I don't have anything to do with salvation now. I don't have anything to do with change of life now. I don't have anything to do with holiness without which no man shall save the Lord now. Let me enjoy my life. If you die in in that condition. The Lord said you'll be eternally separated from God and then you'll be eternally associated with Satan, evil angels and the wicked. Number six, the Lord Jesus said the kind of punishment that the people are going to receive refers to them as everlasting fire. It refers to the punishment as unquenchable fire. It refers to it as a furnace of fire. It refers to it as hell fire. And then he said number seven, it will be in complete darkness and eternal night. Complete darkness and eternal night. Have you ever been in darkness before? And it is so thick and it is so dark, you cannot find your way. Maybe that was just for a night when it took, out, when it took away electricity. Or maybe it was just for a few, maybe a few days. But this one is going to be eternal. One year, two years, three years, and you'll not see light at all. Only the pain of the hellfire, only the association of Satan and the evil angels and the wicked people that are also there. That's the reason why you need to actually think about your destiny and about your eternity and if you are not born again to give your life to the Lord Jesus Christ because what shall he profit a man if he gains the whole world and he loses his own soul what shall man give in exchange for his soul that's why Jesus Christ warned the people and said the harvest is the end of the world as therefore the tires are gathered and they are burnt in the fire so shall it be in the end of this world the son of man shall send forth his angels and he shall gather out of his kingdom all things that are fain, and them which do iniquity and shall cast them into a furnace of fire, there shall be wailing and gnashing of teeth. The time of this prophetic parable has now arrived in Revelation chapter 14. For the time is come for thee to reap, and they have for the harvest of the earth is ripe. And the time alluded to here is the end of the world. And he that sat on the cloud that is Christ, the king, the judge, thrust in his sickle on the earth, and the earth was reaped. The final judgment of the world then is certain, and the time is fast approaching. 
What can you do? What can we do? What can our neighbors do? What can our friends do so that they escape the judgment of God? We must be saved. We must be separated from the world. And we must allow the blood of the Lamb and the power in that blood to so cleanse us and keep us holy because it says follow peace with all men. And holiness without which no man shall see the Lord. If we are not saved, if we are not separated from the world and from the things of the world, there's no way we'll be able to escape the judgment and the punishment that is coming upon the world. That's why the Bible tells us in Acts of the Apostles chapter 17, Acts of the Apostles, chapter 17. And we're reading together there from verses 30 and 31. Acts, chapter 17, reading from verse 30 and 31. Verse 30, verse 31. And the times of this ignorance God winked at, but now commanded all men everywhere to repent. That's how to escape the judgment of God. Now he commands all men everywhere to repent because he has appointed a day in the which he will judge the world in righteousness by that man whom he has ordained. is a foreordained judge whom he has ordained whereof he has given assurance unto all men in that he has raised him from the dead. We'll come now to point number three, the execution of the judgment of the earth. In Revelation chapter 14, Revelation chapter 14, reading from verse 17 all through to verse 20. Revelation chapter 14, verse 17. And another angel came out of the temple, which is in heaven, he also having a sharp sickle. And another angel came out of the earth from the altar, which had power over fire, and cried with a loud cry unto him that had the sharp sickle, saying, Thrust in thy sharp sickle, and gather the clusters of the vine of the earth, for her graves are fully ripe. And the angel thrust in his sickle into the earth and gathered the vine of the earth and cast it into the great winepress of the wrath of God. Cast all the harvest and all that he got. He cast everything to the winepress of the wrath of God. And the winepress was trodden without the city, outside the city. And blood came out of the winepress. That means these people were killed, these people were destroyed. And then their blood was spilled out. And there were so many that eventually it says that the blood even got to the horse bridle. That is uh, the bridle of the horse. If you have known when they harness a particular horse and they're going to ride that's like uh, some feet from the ground and it says by the space of a thousand and six hundred four lungs when you divide that by eight you're going to have about 200 miles that is the blood was just flowing and the blood was like a river a river of blood flowing out of the people that were destroyed by the judgment of God that means it's a great great multitude you learn something from this there are some people that say well the majority are doing it and see the majority are doing it it must be all right a God eventually will give up if he knows that a lot of people, a multitude, they're doing something. And that means that God will paralyze and God will be impotent. God will not be able to judge them anymore. A multitude is doing it. Don't deceive yourself. The whole world, if the whole world is doing the wrong thing, the righteous God, the holy God of heaven, he will judge them. The whole of Sodom and Gomorrah, they were doing the wrong thing. He judged every one of them. And the whole of the world at the time of Noah, they were doing the wrong thing, except Noah and his wife and the three sons and the three, and the three wives of the three sons, except the eight people. The whole world, they were doing the wrong thing, and yet the Lord judged them. The whole of Israel, they were doing the wrong thing, and they rejected the Lord Jesus Christ in his earthly ministry and none of them was saved they said your blood be upon you i leave your house unto you desolate that the whole world is doing something doesn't mean that the lord is going to excuse them here we find these people that are rich that come into the harvest of judgment they're so great and there's so many and they were thrown into the wine press of the wrath of god of the judgment of god and as they were threshed what the bible says is that their blood was running 200 miles 1600 furlongs and then it says it's up to the, the, the horse bride.
how this age shall come to a close and how this earth shall come to its final historic, historical consummation in the intervention of God has been revealed to the prophets from the time of the Old Testament. This vision reaffirms what had been predicted and revealed to Joel and to Isaiah, to Ezekiel and to many others. And now the time had come. And as the time comes, and I need to tell you that from the signs of the times, from what we're seeing today, we know that the time is very, very near. Very, very near. All we're waiting for now is for the trumpet to sound. And the dead in Christ to rise up. And then we which are alive to be caught up together with them in the clouds. And after the church is gone, a time of terrible tribulation, great tribulation, will begin in this world. And it will not be long, just a period of seven years. And all this that we're reading, that we're reading will be taking place in very rapid succession. Just uh, devastations, destructions, and, and uh, evil things coming upon the people of this world. And in the one we're reading today, the Lord is saying, uh, through that angel to the other angel, and say, thrust in thy sickle. Gather the clusters of the vines of the earth, because our graves are fully ripe. Uh, when it says our graves are fully ripe, that means they have come to the, uh, they have come to the peak of their sin. They have come to the climax of their evil. And they have come to a point of no return. The cup of iniquity is full. The, great, the day of grace is over. The time of final judgment eventually has come. And there is no remedy anymore. The sinners represented here as, uh, represented like the graves. And it says that the vines of the earth, they are cast into the great one press of the wrath of God. And these uh, graves, these people are crushed in judgment under the feet of the great judge. And the Jews resembling blood flow out of them and the slaughter will be so great to produce a lake or a sea of blood the earthly end of all sinners is frightening and the eternal suffering is terrible that's why you need to decide today and say Lord I'm not going to perish with those people and you will not perish with them the Lord will deliver us as we give ourselves to him in Jesus' name. Let me remind you once again that this Jesus Christ, who is a gentle Savior and a meek, lowly Christ, now will be the final judge on that day. In Revelation chapter 19, verse 11. Revelation chapter 19, I'm reading from verse 11. And I saw heaven open. And behold, the white horse, and he that sat upon him was called faithful and true. That's the Lord Jesus Christ in righteousness. He does judge and make war. He's the judge. And in righteousness, he does judge. Do you know there are people that are living their lives as if judgment day will not come? As if whatever you do, you just do it. Who cares? Who knows? God is too busy to think about what you are doing. That's what they think. And they do whatever they want to do. They may read the Bible. They don't believe what they read in the Bible. They don't tremble at the coming judgment of God. And the word of God is saying, How shall we escape if we neglect so great salvation? And he's telling us in verse 12, His eyes were as a flame of fire. And on his head were many crowns. And he had a name reaching that no man knew but he himself in verse 13 and was clothed with a vesture dipped in blood and his name is called the word of God and the armies which were in heaven followed him upon white horses clothed in fine linen white and clean and out of his mouth goeth a sharp sword that he that with it he might smite the nations might smite the nations. There are many nations today that, will, you know, you have a great percentage say they're atheists. And they say they don't know God. Ah, the time is coming when Jesus Christ, the mighty judge and the great judge, he will smite the nations with the sword of his mouth. And he shall rule them with a rod of iron. And he treadeth the winepress of the fierceness and the wrath of almighty God. I have spoken about this many, many years before, about 700 years before Jesus came into this world in Isaiah chapter 13. Isaiah chapter 13, I'm reading to you from verse 6. Let us see what uh, these uh, prophets of God knew in Revelation, through Revelation, on the judgment that will come upon this world on the final day. In Isaiah chapter 13, reading from verse 6. How are ye? For the day of the Lord is at hand. It shall come as a destruction from the Almighty. And then it tells us in verse 7, Therefore shall all hands be faint, and every heart uh, shall, shall melt, and they shall be afraid, 
pangs and sorrow shall take hold of them. They shall be in pain as a woman that travaileth. They shall be amazed one at another. Their faces shall be as flames. Behold, the day of the Lord cometh cruel, both with wrath and fierce anger to lay the land desolate. He shall destroy the sinners thereof out of it. In verse 13, it tells us, Therefore I will shake the heavens, and the earth shall remove out of her place in the wrath of the Lord of hosts, and in the day of his fierce anger. In chapter 34, Isaiah chapter 34, and we're looking at it from verse 1. You see what had been revealed to this a great man of God, as for the judgment that will be coming upon this earth. If it's been said in different chapters, in different books of the Bible, and Christ himself also revealed it how you need to run today how you need to come to the Lord today and escape the judgment of God it says in chapter 34 of Isaiah from verse 1 come near ye nations and to hear and hearken ye people let the earth hear and let and all that is therein the world and all things that come forth of it for the indignation of the Lord is upon all nations. The indignation, the wrath, the judgment, the anger of the Lord is upon all, all nations. His fury upon all their armies. He has utterly destroyed them. He has delivered them to the slaughter. And that's what we read about in Revelation chapter 14. They will be so slaughtered, multitudes of them, that it will form a sea of blood running for 200 miles. In verse 3 it says, Their slain also shall be cast out, and their sting shall come out, shall come up out of the carcasses, and the mountains shall be melted with their blood. All the host of heaven shall be dissolved, and the heaven shall be rolled together as a scroll. All their holes shall fall down as the leaf falleth from up the vine and as a falling fig uh, from the fig tree. For my sword shall be burst in heaven. Behold, it shall come down upon Idumea and upon the people of my curse to judgment. The sword of the Lord is filled with blood. It is made fat with fatness and with the blood of lambs and goats with the fat of the kidneys of rams for the Lord as a sacrifice in Bosra and a great slaughter in the land of Idumea, and the unicorns shall come down with them, and the bulldogs uh, with, the, with the bulls, and their land shall be soaked with blood, and their dust uh, made their dust made fat with fatness, for it is the day of the lost benches. And a year of recompenses for the controversy over Zion. And the streams thereof shall be turned into pitch. And the doors thereof into limestone. And the, and the land thereof shall, be, shall come to burning pitch. It shall not be quenched. Night nor day, the smoke thereof shall go up forever. For the generation, from generation to generation, it shall lie waste. None shall pass through it forever and ever. And you see the language of uh, Isaiah as the God revelation from the Lord that judgment will come. And you'll see the way he talks about the blood of the slain, the blood of the people that are judged. That's why it says in that revelation that we, we have read that their blood will just be flowing for 200 miles. That is 1,000. 1,600 followers, it will just be flowing like that because there are so many that the Lord has judged. And I'm asking you, are you part of the few that are saved or you are part of the multitude that are doing evil? And then you are shrugging your shoulders, says, I'm not alone. If everyone is going to fall, it's not going to fall on me alone. There are many people that are doing it. You'll forget there are many people that are judged when you come into judgment. If a person is having a terrible headache and it's really racking your brain and knocking your head and tearing you apart, you will forget there are other people that are having a headache. If you're in a burning house and the, and the fire is burning you, although there may be other people that are being burned by the fire, you'll forget that there are other people that are being burned to a fire. If somebody has cancer for for example, as in, if she's in the hospital, she will forget there are other patients in the hospital having cancer. When the pain of your own cancer is terrible on you, you forget other people. There's a woman that is laboring and the pain is coming upon her. She will forget the pain of other, other women that are also wanting to deliver children to say that heaven is going to fall. It's not only one man's business. Other people are going to suffer it. You will forget about that. When you get to hell and you get into hell fire, if you refuse to repent, you will forget the 
devil is even there and uh, the demons are there and the other wicked people are there, it will be as if you are the only one that is suffering that hellfire. That's why the Lord is calling upon you today and saying, repent, repent. Why will you die? Why will you allow sin to be your ruin? That's why the Lord is telling us that if we're going to repent, here is the time. This is the day of giving our lives to the Lord. In 2 Corinthians chapter 5, 2 Corinthians chapter 5, and we're looking at it from verse 11. Second Corinthians chapter 5, it is what the Lord is telling us. He's sending preachers to us, he's sending soul winners to us, he's sending the people that are warning us and they're telling us, this is a time of escape, and this is the way, this is the day of redemption, the day of salvation. Call upon the Lord before it is too late. In Second Corinthians chapter 5, I'm reading from verse 11. Knowing therefore the terror of the Lord, we persuade men, but we are made manifest unto God and I trust also made manifest in your own conscience. In your own conscience you have had the word of God tonight. You know the word of God tonight and you know if you die in sin you have nobody to blame now because you have had the clear word of God. Knowing therefore the terror of the Lord we persuade men. What's the Lord telling us? Number one, be warned and be prepared. You've heard the word of God. You've seen the word of God. You know that judgment day is coming. Be warned and be prepared. Number two, be watchful and be pure. The devil will like to make you impure. Will like to pull you back into sin. Will like to make you backslide. But remember, blessed are the pure in heart. Only they shall see the Lord. Remember, who shall ascend to the hill of the Lord? Who shall stand in his holy place? They that have clean hands and a pure heart. Remember, follow peace with all men and holiness without which no man shall see the Lord. Lest any of you become like Esau, that soul this birthright. And you know that he sought it carefully with tears afterwards. And he was rejected because he found no place to repent. Be watchful and be pure. Number three, be wise and be persevering. Be wise and be persevering. Understand that the day of grace will soon end and the time of mercy will soon end and the Lord is giving you the chance today. Be wise and be persevering. Number four, be a witness and be a peacemaker. That as you have escaped, as you have been saved, as you have been sanctified and you are getting ready for the rapture and you are saying, Lord Jesus, come. We're expecting you. How about your name? How about your friends? How about the people that do not know what you know? They do not have what you have. Be a witness. Be a witness and be a peacemaker and have the ministry of reconciliation bringing people to the Lord and the Lord will help us. I said the Lord will help us. One thing, number one, is that you keep yourself in the grace of God. Don't go into the world. Don't go back into sin. Because, you know, it may be at the day you go back to sin, the rapture takes place. You'll be enduring for all these years. And now you are gone. And you go through the great tribulation. How are you going to make it? But if you keep watching, if you keep praying, if you keep uh, looking up to the Lord, that, Lord, I have been in this, in, you know, in the grace of God, in the kingdom of God all these years. I'm not going to allow the devil to pull me back into the mud, into the mess again. And then you're also telling other people. You're warning them, escape from the judgment of God. And God... God will bless the word of your mouth. And the people will come to know the Lord. You will be saved. Your children will be saved. Your family will be saved. And your friends and neighbors too, they will be saved. They will escape the judgment of God. Let's rise up and talk to the Lord in prayer. And say, Lord, I've heard your word. Judgment is coming. Judgment is coming. All will be there. Those who have rejected, those who have refused, they will go through the judgment of God. Where will you be on that final day? Where will you be on that final day? Judgment is coming. You need to call upon the Lord and say, Lord, I give myself to you. I want to be saved if you have not been saved. I want to give myself to you if you have not given your life to the Lord Jesus Christ. Are you ready for the coming of the Lord? Are you ready for the judgment day? There's a great day coming. There's a great day coming by and by. There's a great day coming when the saints and the sinners shall be parted right and left. Are you ready for that day to come? Tell the Lord I want to be ready. When the Lord shall come. I want to be ready. When the Lord shall come. When the Lord shall come, are you saved? Are you weak or tear? Are you fake or are you for real? Are you genuine or are you a counterfeit? Are you just going in and out with the people of God but are big a fat zero and you are a great hypocrite and you have not really given your life to the Lord Jesus Christ and you are doing iniquity and you are offending and you are making other people to stumble. They think you are a believer. They are looking at your example and they are going astray and they are backsliding and they are committing sin or you are committing sin with them privately or you are leading them into evil. What will you do on that final day? 
Where will you be on that final day? Why don't you come to the Lord? Because the blood of Jesus is still flowing. And the blood of Jesus is still cleansing. And the blood of Jesus is still changing lives and transforming people. And you can say, Lord, I give myself to you. I give myself to you. Please don't play with this time. Don't joke with this time. This is the time of salvation. And this is the time of restoration. This is the time to give your life to the Lord Jesus Christ. This is the time for you to plead for the mercy of God, the grace of God, the cleansing of the Lord. Wash me, Lord. Wash me, Lord. Cleanse me, Lord. I want to be serious now with my destiny. I don't want to throw my destiny away. I want to give myself completely to the Lord. Lord, I am here. Lord, I am here. Have mercy upon me. Don't let me die like this. Don't let me perish like this. Don't let me go astray like this. I give myself to you. The Lord will receive you. The Lord will receive you. It's a merciful God. Seek ye the Lord while he may be found. Call ye upon him while he is near. Let the wicked forsake his way. And the righteous man is thus. Let him return unto the Lord. For the Lord will abundantly pardon. The Lord will give you salvation. Call upon the name of the Lord. Whosoever shall call on the name of the Lord shall be saved. And tell him to give you grace. Grace to be righteous. Grace to be pure. Grace to be holy. Grace to remain as a new creature in Christ. If any man be in Christ, it's a new creature. Old things are passed away. Behold, all things are become new. Settle it with the Lord before you go, so that the day will not come upon you unprepared.